Okay, uh, today's topic is on uh, food safety. And uh, food safety, one of the major concern uh, is the uh, drugs or chemicals that we have. Uh, I'm not so sure of your background. Uh, most uh, students in biochemistry, I would like to explain more on the molecular mechanism. So I only have one slide today about the molecular mechanisms. But uh, to serve as, a, as an introduction to the topic, I try to elaborate a little bit more of the different chemicals. So I try not to make this too quantitative. Having said that, however, when we study toxicology, since the golden rule is that the uh, dose makes the poison, if you don't remember everything today, you may like to remember this. We have the dose makes the poison. That is a very important concept. Okay? Nothing is poison, or nothing without poison. Only the dose makes the poison. So, uh, you know, there are many chemicals around, so how are we going to? Uh, explain what we call this known as uh, newly emerging chemicals. I try to make a list, but I'm not so sure how to make a list because the list will be very, very long. <laughs> and uh, as a food profession, uh, you perhaps need to look into using a computer to search for different databases and then to look for the chemicals. But the key words here is that we know that uh, these uh, you know, diseases are all come from what we eat. In Chinese term, uh, we call this a bang chong hao yap, and then of course you know there's a war chong hao chut. If you say something wrong, then perhaps you will be bitten. You know, this is very important nowadays in Hong Kong, just, so just keep your mouth shut and be careful. I'm oh, just kidding. And the uh, principles of toxicology is the first part that I would like to introduce. Uh, in large part, in the last century, we've been involved in studying of Managing the risk, risk, managing the risk, phong him thing. So, because the dose makes the poison, and the kind of chemicals that we look at is usually in trace amount. Trace in Chinese term is called han de. So, there is a very low concentration as low as we have uh, ppm parts per million and then we have ppb parts per billion okay and then ppt we are talking about parts per trillions okay so this is uh, tens uh, minus uh, what six and then nine and then twelve so you are talking about milligram level, microgram level, picogram levels. You know, in Chinese it's called pei ha. So these are very low concentration in the old days, but of course now we have very sophisticated machines or equipment to detect them. So we started off uh, first examples of uh, trace organics. And then we still have a lot of uh, concerns from uh, the herbicides and pesticides. Uh, these are for the killing of pests and also for the killing of herbs. So we call them herbicides and pesticides. And of course, newly imagined chemicals are coming from a group of materials known as electronic waste. Now these chemicals, uh, they are like including trace elements and also other what we call brominated compounds. And then the last group of the chemicals come from plastics. You all know what is plastic, right? And uh, so those plastics uh, actually may be in on the clothes with uh, fabric or fibers. And uh, or nylon, you know, one kind of plastic. There are so many different kinds of them. We still don't understand exactly how they cause uh, health problems. But we do know that many of those plastic materials they contain many different chemicals, including, for example, one example is uh, bisphenol A, sulfur A, and uh, they could be uh, uh, dangerous and affecting our health. So finally, we'll 
talk about some uh, future perspective on this topic. So principle of toxicology, as I said, I'm not going to make you a long list, but uh, uh, for many of you, especially in Hong Kong, uh, you might have heard about this uh, uh, story of melamine, Sam Zui Ching On, you know, melamine is a uh, chemical being used in uh, these uh, plastic plates, which is uh, quite common in, in Hong Kong or in China. But then at the same time, uh, around 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, people actually used this melamine to falsify. Falsify means it's not real, but they add a lot of nitrogen in here. Because when you detect like, a protein content, the major technique is to use acid to digest all the samples into nitrogen. So then you measure the nitrogen content that would represent some sort of uh, protein content. Due to the fact that if you want to find some uh, diet or feed or even milk product, these are the products, right? Sometimes uh, very difficult to fulfill the requirement of high protein content. Then uh, people started to play around with the chemistry by adding in this. In the beginning, they thought, that, oh, I add it as uh, pet food, uh, that shouldn't be a problem, but sorry. Many of those pets actually they need to send to the to the uh, wet or to the veterinary school in order to uh, clean up their kidneys. So they all have problems in the kidney. And then later on, uh, this was a big story because that uh, they later on uh, used that in meal product, and that also created a collapse of uh, an industry, almost collapse, right? More now was accused uh, to use all them that they said, oh that was from Australia, the milk from Australia, yeah the milk from Australia but in the middle they mix this uh, melamine into it uh, leading to the uh, problem of this uh, guawa, okay, big head uh, 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 baby okay. so at the time uh, China's agricultural minister acknowledged this uh, problem and then later on uh, the news could not be found in China at all so I'm not so sure whether you can still see this uh, news, but uh, perhaps if you read the NBC or BBC, you'll still be able to find all these uh, data. But that was 10 or 20 uh, or 15 years ago, and then uh, people realized the danger of these chemicals. Uh, you may consider those uh, newly emerging chemicals, and they just come and go, come and go. So today I would like to share with you my story on uh, the uh, newly emerging chemicals in food. Many of these uh, chemicals, first they were made, like for example, uh, manufacturing of uh, the chemicals, pollutants. Uh, many, many years ago, like the Vietnam War, uh, in the last century, in the 60s and 70s, today, in Vietnam and Cambodia, they still have such chemicals, those are persistent chemicals, very persistent, never go away. They are known as Agent Orange, they are byproducts of those uh, chlorine related chemicals, including many pesticides. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, soldiers, US soldiers, they came into contact and then they discovered this. And of course, today, those uh, Vietnamese or Cambodians, uh, they work in the field, uh, they were uh, exposed to those chemicals. And these chemicals, of course, uh, would, uh, or would be included nowadays uh, for incineration. Incineration is also known as combustion, burning in uh, layman terms, just burning. You burn this organic substance from pollution and contamination. Now, nowadays we don't really have much pollution, you may say, but we do have a lot of problem of contamination because we are talking about these uh, low concentrations. And then all in all, all these chemicals, they would together go into food chain. We would say, okay, if these chemicals are stable, if these chemicals are persistent, you could hardly get rid of them. You know the first law of second uh, of thermodynamic, right? Uh, chemicals or energy could neither be destroyed nor created. All these chemicals, they just go to somewhere else. At the end, they would go into, that would be very dangerous. If they get into the food chain, we have this what we call bioaccumulation effects or biomagnification effects from these different trophic levels, from algae to fish, fish to bigger fish, or uh, to crops, and then to human being, accumulating all these chemicals going into the dairy products, including meat, 
like for example beef and fish and also milk etc. So you guys uh, perhaps still enjoy eating this every day, we call this dairy product because you eat them every day. Milk, trees, uh, sushi, everybody likes uh, to eat salmon. Then in the morning you have salmon, in the afternoon you have salmon, and then at night you also have salmon. So you all feel very happy until the day that you find yourself in trouble. Uh, but you are not so sure what happened. I mean, you could not really confirm, okay, because I ate all this uh, salmon or uh, sushi. Therefore, I got myself into these different types of, uh, of uh, chronic diseases. We are talking about very low concentration and also chronic diseases. Of course, among all these food problems, uh, one of the issues is on the bacteria and pathogens. They also emerge, I only have one slide for this because I'm not a microbiologist, and uh, these are not chemical, these are mainly what we call pathogens from uh, infectious disease. You know what? Due to uh, global warming, all these uh, microorganisms uh, they were found in Africa, but our day could also be found in America or in North America. We don't have much data from Asia, but at least this data from WHO summarizing all these different chemicals. Some are new, some are old, like influenza is always with us. The uh, drug resistant uh, salmonella is always with us. We have the E. coli and so on. And recently, a yeah, superbug, <coughs> antibiotic resistant microorganisms is also of our major concern. <coughs> All right? And there are also, in many cases, uh, that would be uh, involving in uh, terrorist attack, deliberately added into the food and that would create a lot of problems, okay? We don't have time to go through this uh, bacterial infection, but today we focus on the chemicals. You may say, okay, people are actually uh, in the healthcare system. So we are looking at the data, and the data tell us that we are healthier. The lifespan is longer, right? The life expectancy, like for example, Hong Kong already, uh, 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 People of Hong Kong are having a longer lifespan than Japanese used to be, number one in Japan. So they actually came to Hong Kong and look at what Hong Kong people do. You know, Hong Kong people spend a lot of time doing exercise, going hiking to Lime Rock and so on. These are one of the reasons, but however, having said that, around the world, there are neglected tropical diseases, as I've told you, those are diseases from Africa or Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, we are talking about 1.7 billion people. And then uh, air pollution, indoor, indoor air pollution. You will be surprised to learn that actually household uh, air pollution okay, are causing many deaths every year. Not just from smoking, but also from cooking fuels. If you cook or we smell, oh, that's smell very good, chicken wing or pan fry, you know, fish, oh, smell very good, but that could be dangerous, all right? So again, we don't have time to go over all this uh, data, but it's mainly from WHO data. Now, then we come to the point, why are we concerned with what we have to deal with or we concerned? That it's all about what we call risk, or risk-benefit analysis. Oh, I like to do barbecue. <laughs> Even so, okay, you, you go ahead to handle the charcoal. Oh, I just stay here and eat. Okay, your friend probably spent most of the time, oh, all the cooking oil and smoke are spreading around. Say like you go to Thai restaurant. One good example is I go to Thai restaurant, a very famous one in Dong Chong Ho. The ladies stand over there and then keep cooking all the film and, and, and charcoal boiling. Uh, but of course, they are very delicious. Then you would say, oh, benefits. The benefits is over the risk. Oh, I don't mind eating. Oh, salmon or steak, they are so delicious. I'm taking the risk. Oh, I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> but if I die without eating steak or salmon, I would prefer not to have you know, a full life then I will be regretted, we have food, and so I better eat it, you like, you know, like for example, uh, char siu, barbecue pork, contains a lot of uh, benzoapyrin, 
Bun Bang Bay. It's a constant research they're doing. Then uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in many restaurants now, they change to a different kind of uh, long charcoal type of an electrical grills. And then they just hang all those uh, sucking pig, uh, siu mo, and all the barbecue stuff, uh, all made in those uh, electric grills instead of uh, charcoal. Okay, so because the benefit is so huge. But if you look at uh, the point that I'm trying to compare, so sometimes it's very difficult to draw a line. Everybody likes sushi, right? So how can we calculate? We have a formula, I have a formula for you. You may calculate it, okay? And then, uh, yeah. So some uh, risks are actually uh, for the observability, very high. Bicycle, you run bicycle, you hit. If you don't have a helmet, then you probably hurt your head. Including ski, every year after the winter, you will see many uh, students, uh, like in North America, they end up coming back with uh, crutches. Okay, that's what we call observable. Low observability. X-ray, you cannot really see the radiation. Or caffeine, you drink coffee every day, but you could hardly tell whether it's how much caffeine is in there. And then on the x-axis, low and high, we call it drag level. Drag level is very high, like for example, pesticide. You spray it, then you see, oh, that's a pesticide. And then, of course, nuclear weapon, you would uh, realize that, oh, that is a very high drag level. Like, for example, uh, tear gas. You know, nowadays in Hong Kong, oh, we have to stay away from the tear gas. High drag level, but then uh, also a high, high uh, 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 observability. So probably somewhere here, or commercial aviation. Every day you heard about, you turn on the radio, oh, that was plane crash. But still, you still like to travel on plane, right? Mm -hmm. You have no choice, not just you have no choice, because you have to balance the risk and benefit. Every morning you turn on the radio, oh, there's a car accident somewhere, or train accident somewhere, but still, you still like to, but oh, that's the only choice. I still like to take this high-speed rail even though the risk could be high, but the benefit is also uh, 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 good. So, uh, so sometimes it's very difficult, what I'm trying to explain to you, sometimes it's very difficult to balance risk and benefits. And sometimes you only see the benefits and you ignore the risk. Okay, the last slide I have on uh, 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 principle of uh, toxicology is that there are chemicals. And these chemicals, they need to what? Uh, enter your body to take action. I say that again. They need to take action. Before that, how can they take action? They need to get into your body. But, not just that. Drug metabolism, I suppose you have heard about uh, uh, Professor Lerm's uh, uh, lecture, not just uh, absorption, absorption or administration and then distribution, metabolism and excretion. Some chemicals come in and then go out immediately, or clearance rates. Clearance rates could be uh, less than uh, one day, okay? There are many chemicals uh, doing that way, but if those are food chemicals and you eat it every day, so some uh, scientific investigators, oh, the clearance of uh, lead is very high. You don't really accumulate it. The problem is because you drink water. The lead in water could be dangerous because you drink water every day. So having considered that, the second thing is that the dose makes the poison. So that is also a very important concept. The concentrations come, or the dose is a concentration. And then we need to measure the actual dose inside your body. Uh, of course, it could be it would be difficult to do any experiments on human beings. So in any case, we need more clinical data. We need more clinical data to support our uh, hypothesis. And for that, sometimes we are still lacking. And uh, yeah, so uh, because we are now talking about a chronic effects, and these chronic effects usually are quite difficult to study. Like for example, develop into cancer. Actually, cancer is the number one enemy among human beings, so we do pay a lot of attention to the chronic effects of mainly uh, cancer. And then uh, one final concept is that when the chemicals get into our body, 
Number one, they need to act on the cell. You know, cell is the basic unit of biological organism. If they do not get into the cell, if they do not get into the DNA, they don't cause any mutation, so therefore won't cause any cancer. There are different ways that they could go in. Why trace organics would be dangerous? Because they could diffuse through the lipid bilayer. On the membrane, this is what we call lipid bilayer. It's a lipid. They just go through by diffusion. Okay, of course, there will be other channels or carrier that would bring the chemicals in. All right, say like, for example, uh, uh, metals, dimethyl iron, they probably could slip in through other dimethyl iron carrier, like a copper transporter or a calcium transporter. Okay, so there must be some way that they could. Get in. With this concept in your mind, the first group of chemicals that we, I would like to explain to you or elaborate to you is this trace organics. They are still around. We try very hard to get rid of them, but then you will see the benefits of using them. Uh, we'll talk about pesticides later, but these are pesticides including aldrin, diadrin, andrin, cordain, uh, DDT, heptacor, myrex, Toxaphane and also hexachlorobenzene. They all are organic chemicals, so they will be called them trace organic. They all form this under the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, known as POPs, persistent organic chemicals. Why are they so persistent? Because they have this carbon ring, making them very stable. Not just that, they also consist of these, uh, we call it chlorinated compounds. You see this uh, chloride, chloride, all these chlorine in the compound, including those industrial chemicals or unwanted by products like uh, 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 dioxin or fluorex. Okay, so these chemicals are actually still affecting us every day. The 12 pops identified by UNEP and then under the Stockholm Convention, all these chemicals now are of our uh, uh, major concern. For example, Daoxin, Yoping in uh, Chinese term. Uh, I don't really like those uh, Chinese translations, they call it Bo you know, and Ying. And, and, the, and another Longman dictionary, in the old days, they even translate, they just translated into Dai Ho San. But the chemicals come from this Dai Benzo para Dioxin. Dai Benzo means that two benzene ring. And then with two oxygen, we call it para dioxin, the two oxygen linked together. And then the other carbon here on the benzene ring would be linked to any coordination or bromination. This time, mainly the coordination. The most uh, toxic dioxin, we usually call it dioxins here with an S, because there are long, even numbers of chlorides or chlorines adding into the number of isomers could be 75. And then uh, this one, uh, 2378-tetra-polodibenzo-p-dioxin, P means para, or 2378-t4-tcdv, is the most dangerous or the most toxic chemicals. Uh, we seldom use them for experiment, but it's the most uh, toxic chemicals ever made by human. And this dioxin and dioxin like compound, they actually exist. Like they're still around us, a uh, very high concentration, I would say perhaps in uh, Eastern Europe and also in uh, Vietnam or Cambodia and in China as well. Uh, so, this is what we call the dibenzo dioxin with two oxygen and then different numbers of correlation. We call them PCDD. If it's only one oxygen, we call them furans, PCDF. And then, if it's uh, no oxygen linking the two phenyl ring, we call them polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, dolopin. It depends on the numbers of the coordination here. But that uh, these chemicals mainly from uh, electric products, they are in plastic, uh, because it's form a very good uh, compound to avoid any electricity. So. From now on, we call this dioxins and dioxin like compound. And uh, there's one compound, uh, Bun Beng Bei, I just mentioned in uh, barbecue pork, 
There's no correlation, but structurally speaking, there are five rings there making it a very stable carbon unit or chemicals. We call them trace organic. They have one thing in common. They are mixtures. They are mixtures, and then they work together by binding to, as I mentioned before, they could go in through the membrane by diffusion. And then when they go in, they need to interact with this uh, H receptor, which is a protein. This is a receptor that would bind the chemicals and then eventually it would go in with its partner known as ARNT, H receptor nuclear translocator. It's called nuclear translocator because they translocate the whole complex into the nucleus. Oh, into the nucleus, I try to simplify this diagram to direct gene expression, to what kind of genes are they going to induce? C1A, this is the enzyme. The enzyme that would metabolize the chemical. Making this chemical from hydrophobic to more hydrophilic. But then at the same time, it would activate the chemicals. So it is kind of what we call uh, uh, yin yang, or two phase. Now you activate the chemical in order to remove them. But then at the same time, you have activated the chemicals. It requires phase two and phase three enzyme to remove it. But if you cannot remove them right away, then you we have trouble uh, because all these enzymes are supposed to uh, activate them, and then they will come back and attack DNA. So that's the mechanism of these uh, chemicals. The toxicological endpoint we are trying to monitor is cancer. Of course, this is not easy to study because you need a lifetime experiment to do those. Uh, uh, characterization of exposure and dose response, uh, animal tests. At the time, a uh, very long time ago, in the early uh, 60s, uh, there was a senator called Dinani. They developed this Dinani course. And then uh, they said, oh, all chemicals should be banned, which is what we call a zero tolerance law. And nowadays, we know that it's almost impossible. <coughs> impossible. Meaning that because these chemicals are everywhere. I'm so fortunate that everywhere. So it's impossible to set up this what we call zero tolerance law. We change to have this concept of de minimis or negligibility. Now we have to minimize the dosage. Now we have to minimize the dosage. Dose makes the poison, right? So which dose should be banned? Oh, we have to minimize it as low as possible. So what's the lowest? Usually it's the what? Detection limit of the machine. Detection limit. If the machine cannot detect it, that would be very low. No, 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 no. Maybe the machine is not good enough. Now we have HPLC, MS, and MS. HPLC, not enough. And then we have MS, MOSFET. And another MOSFET. Wow. And GC, MS, MS. Multi-million machines. We could detect not just a picogram level, or even nanogram level, you know, 10 to minus 15, PPB or PPT. The chemical extraction methods are also very good. So the, the minimum concept usually is down to the deception level. So uh, what we ought to do is to determine what we call a tolerable daily intake. They spend years to develop this. I'm not kidding. Not just years but also many different organizations are involved to discuss this. So this is a WHO recommendation, okay, WHO. So, uh, but at the time they measure it, so the tolerable daily intake, one to four picogram of ITEQ, why it's called ITEQ is the method that we combine, combining all the dioxin and dioxin light compound, including all the 75 isomers, not just two, three, seven, uh, tetra, coral, dibenzo, dioxin, but also other dioxin, and also other furans, and also the PCBs, and also the what? Benzo A pyrene. Okay. Sometimes uh, we don't we don't really need to cover the benzo pyrene, and then we add them together. The upper limit is set as four, but then uh, according to the guideline, they say, "Whoa, well, we better make it go down to one picogram." per kilogram per day, that is the recommendation. Only the recommendation. Don't ask me why it's not uh, 1.5, you know, just for convenience, 1 to 4 is the range. 
We better set it down to one, but most of the time we could hardly get it down to one. And uh, of course, this concept you would say may not be a good one, but this is so far the most reliable or useful using the TF values to calculate this DET. Binding them together, uh, we also have given international food standard from WHO or from Cortex. In China and also in Hong Kong, we usually use uh, Cortex. The old days, we used more European standard under the British rule before 1997. But now we are moving on to uh, the uh, uh, WHO or Cordex. WHO and Cordex, usually they are more relaxed because they have to consider many different countries. And then Europe and UK, they are usually more stringent with a higher standard. Now this is only one of the examples. I tried to cut only one slide for the data we have. From the uh, Hong Kong, we have this uh, center of food safety. Okay, so did that twice. This is a uh, slide and also their report. And then they will tell you, oh, we are pretty safe. And then uh, daily exposure after the calculation, we calculate the different kinds of food, and then they estimate the amount of food we eat. And then uh, in that study, they calculate uh, around 21.92 picogram per kilogram body weight per month. Now, this is per month. I'm so sorry to confuse you. WHO standard is per day, one to four, right? Oh, this is good, it's uh, lower than one, because one month uh, has uh, 30 days. So 21 divided by 30, that is below one, it's pretty good. That this is only the average figure. You can see that it's still higher than the US, surprisingly. Uh, lower than Japan, I'm not surprised, because Japanese eat a lot of seafood. UK as well, they eat a lot of seafood. And China is in within the range. Uh, China in some part of the country also higher than that in Hong Kong and so on. Sweden, interestingly, Finland and Sweden in uh, 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 Scandinavian, Northern Europe, they have a higher value. But if we look at this, what we call high consumer, the 95%, sorry, the 5%, top 5% seafood lover, meat lover, you know, fish ball in the morning, Shoshi in the afternoon, more shoshi at night. Avocados are a high consumer. All right, 59.65. So, well, we say, oh, we're still within the WHO recommendation between 1 to 4, right? 59 divided by 30 it would be 2. So it's in the middle. But these are recent study. The WHO recommendation was uh, prepared around uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So I would expect that we could do better, but still within range. Uh, and then for the average person, it's uh, less than one. And then for the high consumer, it's uh, between one to four or two uh, picogram or TEQ of this uh, dioxin and dioxin light compound per kilogram body weight per month. Uh, so this, this would be the study that we have done before, but then you realize that actually we are higher than other country in terms of this high consumer. And so we have to still uh, watching this very carefully. Okay. So the first group is what we call trace organics. They are still around. We try to minimize it. However, uh, we are working on it. Okay. And you guys love seafood so much. Okay. Another kind of seafood contaminants is mercury, which I don't have time to, to explain it. But then uh, we move on to pesticides and uh, herbicides. Pesticides and herbicides, uh, pesticides are to get rid of the insects or pests, including cockroaches and also flies. Unfortunately, they also kill honeybees. Honeybees is now confirmed to be one of the most important insects on Earth. Herbicides is kind of uh, uh, 